Welcome everyone, it's Chris Kokinos here again, and it doesn't get much bigger and better than this, because with me today, I have the president of the ISMRM, Professor Larry Wold, and the president of the SMRT, Shauna Farquharson, and they're gonna share some um, stories and, and we're gonna get to uh, learn a little bit more about them. Larry and Shauna, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Thanks, Chris, thanks for the invite. And what a year it's been, hey? I think you've both had uh, a, an amazing uh, presidential year. There's been a lot to, a lot to deal with, but, but tell us a bit about what it's been like. And we're only, we're not far out from the annual meeting. Um, so we'd love to hear a little bit about how things have gone and, and when things are, where things are at at the moment. Yeah, no, it's been a, it's been a roller coaster of a year, as you can imagine. <laughs> You know, it's great to have the annual meeting and, and, you know, I think we can say this officially, it's really underway as we speak, right? Uh, you know, the content is online. I, you know, encourage people to register and start browsing uh, talks and abstracts. And uh, the whole idea was to give people enough time to do that at their leisure. And so we have another week of that before the, uh, the live content starts. Yeah, so it, it's been amazing, uh, you know, just twists and turns and plot twists at every uh, every corner. What do you think, Shana? Yeah, this roller coaster of year is an understatement. I think we started in Australia with bushfires and then we're right, right through to this global crisis now. Um, what I've loved is that the ISM and the SMRT has risen to the challenge and they've produced this fantastic program that really kind of reflects the quality that we have at the international meeting. Um, so we've got over 5,000 lectures, uh, presentations, 120 live Q&A sessions that um, Larry just mentioned earlier, those, those start next week. Um, but what they've done is create this amazing opportunity for you to actually view the talks on demand now um, at home. And these are delivered by world experts, clinicians, scientists, radiographers, technologists, industry members. And so, yes, I love the fact that they've managed to capture, you know, the quality of the international meeting and bring it to your home. I think that's a really been, important point. Yeah, Larry, sorry. You. That's been great. And then one thing I would add is that I think the extra time that people had to put together their presentations and maybe even the ability to, you know, edit a slide here has, has made the quality of the presentations uh, really top notch. And so it's been interesting to see that. It was a sort of unexpected uh, side benefit of doing the meeting this way. And yeah, I think everyone getting on and registering now because you don't want to miss the opportunity of actually getting on, looking at all these amazing talks before the, the live meeting. It's a little bit different to usual, but you know, once we get to the meeting is when we'll actually be able to interact with the speakers and moderators, but not actually watch the talks. Yeah. And um, Larry and Shauna, if, if I was to ask, from each of your perspectives, what would you say you've tried really hard to ensure that we've kept in the annual meeting, given that it's transitioned from Sydney, it then was gonna be in Paris, and we're all excited about that, particularly the people from, from Australia. And, and now we're, we're gonna be watching the meeting, just like we're, we're, we're doing this interview here. So. From your perspective, what have you tried to maintain in the meeting? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, the main thing, you know, it, it's a challenge because everybody's in a different time zone. There's no single time zone that uh, that works for everybody. That's you learn that right away. And um, but we wanted to keep, you know, a kind of recognizable flavor uh, to the meeting. And so, of course, the abstracts have the standard uh, format. Uh, we wanted to try to keep the basic, you know, organization and layout the same. Limited the amount of time we demanded of people in a live session to, you know, three or four hours a day, because we just figured that was uh, all you could ask of people. And then, um, yeah, you know, keep this familiar, you know, sort of feel to it. So I think you'll see next week that, you know, in, in the layout of the welcome, the awards, the plenaries, the main lectures, it'll sort of have a familiar feel to it. And then the bulk of the content, you know, the 5,000 abstracts, you'll be able to uh, download uh, whenever you like, or not download, but uh, watch uh, at your convenience. Yeah. 
For us as well, we've, um, the SMRT has really worked hard to complement the ISMRM program. Um, one of the things that I've, I'm very passionate about as a radiographer, we, we need to position ourselves well through education and knowledge to bridge the gap between science and technology and technological advance. And that's actually the theme of our program this year. So one of the things that we've maintained is that we have clinicians, scientists, and radiographers and technologists in every single session. We're going on tour with Larry here. Yeah, <laughs> I love right. this, is fun. <laughs> this is live. Yeah, I'm being kicked out of the kitchen. That's okay. <laughs> There's a great painting behind you there. Um, and so we've got clinicians, scientists, radiographers and technologists in every single session um, talking about the basics and the fundamentals of the scientific advance or the technical advance right through to their clinical application. Um, and so there's something in each session for everybody to learn, whether you're a physicist uh, or whether you're a, a technologist. There's something in every session for you to learn. And what I'm, we've tried to maintain is that we're going to complement the ISMRM program. We've delivered, as Larry said, segments so in every single time zone. There's something for you every single day. Um, the rest of the material is on demand, as we talked about before. But the feeling that we're one community, and this is a meeting from, uh, the, I think that's the point of difference for ISMRM and SMRT for me. It's a meeting by our members, for our members. Everybody on the AMPCs are volunteering. Everybody that gives their talks does so. Everybody shares their knowledge freely. And it's just empowering for everybody within the community globally. So that's what we've tried to maintain and we've tried to be a value add. Would you agree, Larry? Yeah, I would second that. It's, you know, it's arguably the most sort of integrated uh, SMRT, ISMRM meeting you know, in the history of those organizations. Yeah. It's definitely uh, a step uh, a step forward there in, in integrating the sort of content, how it's organized, how it's uh, presented. I mean, I think people will notice that when they when they go to the program on a glance or no longer separated and, you know, the yeah. SMRT registries have, con have access to all the ISMRM content. Yeah. And the ISMR have access to all the SMRT. So if you're working on a problem, you, you can actually see, you know, um, there's quite a few talks focused on the difference advanced imaging makes to the clinical condition. And um, that's gold when you're working, you know, on the technical side. Yeah, definitely. And you've both mentioned um, MR community. I know how important that is. And, and the ISMR and the SMRT is all about community and the people. And, we love um, attending the annual meetings for that reason. But just moving away from the annual meeting for a second, I was going to ask about what MR community means to the both the ISMRM and the SMRT and, and, and how important that whole aspect of who we all are as MR professionals um, in the community. What, what does the SMRT and the ISMRM do essentially for, for, for our MR community globally? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, for me, it's... Um, I'm really proud of the ISMR and the SMRT because it does bring together scientists, clinicians, radiographers, technologists and industry members. There's no other radiological, clinical or technical conference which manages to do that really from the fundamental scientists, you know, or the, they're looking at mathematical models right through to the applications. Um, if you go to any other conference, it's just it's, it, it pales in comparison for me. I think the ISMRM and the SMRT um, really managed to bring that community and the industry members together to be able to help the translation of science and everybody's sort of key in that role. So for me, the fact that they value every single aspect of this community, every single one of those um, positions is important. Um, that, that's for me, where ISM Roman SMRT really are world leaders. What would you say, Larry? Yeah, no, it's definitely, like you said, it's, it's much broader than most societies, you know, which tend to be kind of focused even, you know, within a scientific uh, sort of subfield. Mm -hmm. But, you know, certainly the average, you know, scientific society would be very much uh, focused and just that kind of people. And so this is, you know, trying to hit that full spectrum because, you know, because we do want, you know, our stuff to have impact, you know, in the clinical world and clinical medicine. 
that means you know hitting this whole spectrum from you know you know the science behind the methods to mm -hmm. the methods to the technology and the you mentioned the vendors which are uh, you know industry is an important component of that and then the people of course delivering the care you yeah. know uh, it's uh, not to be left out and uh, yeah so it's important to you know to cover that whole spectrum and the isomerum i think does a sort of uniquely good job of, of trying to do that the isomerum and smrt and uh, you know i think when you ask you know most of the members you know one of the things they really value is that community feel it's also i think a kind of friendly community you know it's yeah. kind of not too Definitely. not too stodgy not too formal you know um, it's not a giant you know party convention either but uh, maybe it should be <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah it's that, that source of community and it's it's definitely one of the things that I think uh, you know is, is hardest to replicate in a virtual meeting and, and uh, I, you know I look forward to next year's meeting hopefully being in person yeah. knock on wood but uh, but yeah to try to make sure we retain some of that sense of uh, of personal connections uh, and you know things like job boards and stuff like that that we can replicate but uh, yeah. but you know the actual interactions i'd like to actually add to that um larry i think you're right you hit the nail on the head like the the great thing about our meeting is the membership <laughs> like a high percentage of our membership actually attend the meeting it's going to be hard to replicate that be but we have put in lots of things in the program for you to be able to do that with the virtual lounge and the exhibition space and we've got certain social initiatives so you've got to look out for those throughout the week but it's mm -hmm. one of the great things about the meeting is you for anybody that hasn't been because a lot of smrt people don't get the chance to go so this is your chance to go to the international meeting yeah, is that point. you you li can literally be sat next to the person that's invented such as Larry, the technology that you use today or the innovator of the technology you're going to use tomorrow. And, you know, you can do that through some of the networking opportunities from the study group opportunities. Um, and, and we're hoping to create those avenues um, within the meeting itself. But it's the members that are going to make that. So it's going to be up to members to we've created a great meeting, I think. And I think they can make it exceptional. So I'm just going to add that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. And and some of, you know, a lot of that, like the study groups that you mentioned, you know, will continue on, you know, virtually uh, through the summer and fall with their meetings. And uh, I think, you know, I don't kind of worry so much about the old timers who are kind of well integrated because they know they're a member of this study group. They'll get the email and they'll, you know, go to the virtual meeting of that study group. It's more of the people entering into the the mix that I think are a little bit of a in danger of you know not knowing about something or not knowing you know what might be interesting or important to attend and you know essentially get left out. So I think that's a danger of you know these the virtualizing the meetings, which of course we didn't have a choice, but uh, but yeah, I would just encourage everybody to you know jump in and like. Uh, you know, try it out. You know, you can yeah. always mute your microphone and <laughs> turn your camera off and <laughs> do your email if it's not uh, your cup of tea. But try some of these virtual workshops and uh, study group meetings. Yeah, I think there's an opportunity there, isn't there, for those people on the, the flip side that are, that are you know a bit worried about getting up um, on a microphone and asking a question. There's the opportunity to get on, watch the talks now, ask any questions. You know, jump on the live QAs. It might create an opportunity for a lot of people to actually um, participate in that in that way, which is might be an added benefit as well. Definitely. I mean, um, you know, the the microphone question things at the end of the talks is nice, but uh, you know, certain people you know <laughs> rush up there and are absolutely confident, and but some people might be a little more hesitant. And quite frankly, a lot of times they just run out of time too. There's just not time for everybody, you know, to, to ask their question after the talk. And uh, I, I think that in that way, this will be better. You know, we there's a, a little chat box after every talk and presentation and, you know, type in a question 
and uh, and then if it, the author doesn't uh, respond to it, you can we can bring it up in the live Q and A session. You know, and that's I'm hoping that the now. authors will respond. Yeah. What's up? And it's probably important to highlight that that's already started. So if you've watched a that's talk, already started. Yeah. If, you, if you're online, you've watched it. It says start discussion. You can start a discussion at a forum level. You can start a discussion directly with the presenter. Um, and you can get your questions in there now. And the moderators will be using some of these in the live Q and A session. So get on, jump on, and yeah, start the conversation. I say. Amen. <laughs> it's well worth it. It's an amazing program. So everyone should be registering today, not waiting for tomorrow, because every day you miss out is a, a day less you have, like Larry mentioned earlier. You can only watch so many talks in a day, but it's unlimited. Once you're registered, you can watch all these talks across both, both societies' content. Now, I've got to ask you both, you're, um, you're obviously passionate in MRI, just like I am, just like most of our members are. Can I ask you both um, individually, what's kept you passionate about MRI over the years? Larry. You know, I have to say it's the way it changes. Uh, you know, it's completely a completely different sort of field specialty than it was 10 years ago. And if it were exactly the same, <laughs> I'm not sure I would be so passionate. <laughs> You know, but it keeps, you know, reinventing itself and new interesting angles keep popping up. And uh, I think that's, you know, that's what makes it an, an exciting uh, field. Yeah. I agree, Larry. It's, um, I remember when I first qualified, we got it in nine, early 90s, we got our first MRI scanner and I think the images were a little bit equivalent to CT back then, <laughs> but uh, it rapidly evolved thanks to um, everyone's help. But it's one of those things for a radiographer, it's a really amazing area to work. You find that radiographers and technologists in MR, they're not the person that presses the button and goes home. They're the ones that really like to, you know, understand the science and technology. They understand the clinical question. Quite often we're given a form, aren't we, Chris, with like two lines, query <laughs> <Yes>. humor. <laughs> and you can see you, you're the one that might be the only person that sees the patient and you have to then have enough understanding of your sequences and your technology to be able to provide the answers for the radiologist so that they can, you know, um, confidently diagnose the condition. And it's kind of like a, such a, it's a, such an evolving space. There's always a new technology out. There's always a new uh, application. And it's just one of the most challenging and rewarding areas of radiography, I think. So, yeah. Well said. Absolutely agree that yeah, we, as, as radiologists or technologists or whoever it might be, we're seeing the, the images live and, and, you know, the referrer might, might have a clinical indication, but we get to see it. So you need to be able to understand how to manage that equipment best to, to get the best result for the yeah. radiologist, whoever it is. Um, now, you're, you're both, uh, Larry, sorry, I was... I was about to say, and it, you know, it, it's getting more complicated. I mean, more <laughs> is demanding <laughs> of everybody across the board from the radiographer to the radiologist and, you know, because, you know, understanding, you know, as the technology gets more complicated and, you know, the certainly imagery constructions, uh, hardware, you know, interpretation with AI, you know, mm -hmm. it just demands more and more of the people doing it. Yeah. So where will we be in 10 years, do we think? <laughs> 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 it is an evolving field, which makes it exciting. But where's it going to be in ten years? What's your prediction? Oh wow, that's you know, <laughs> they always say. <laughs> predictions are difficult, especially about the future. Something like that. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a tough one. I mean, I, you know, I certainly think that you know this the AI aspect of it will certainly grow in ways that are probably difficult to predict and it'll be both uh, helpful and burdensome probably uh, to kind of keep it on track um, but you know certainly expand the power of imaging you know not about that i i also think that uh, you know the type of mr machines will expand that uh, you know we'll see a wider range of either, you know, combined therapy machines, you know, the MR radiotherapy, the, you know, Linac, uh, the 
in our pet, you know, we already have, but, you know, just a, a broader set of flavors of the ice cream. Uh, I would like to see personally, you know, a, a whole set of flavors of portable and, and very low cost and maybe even non-imaging uh, sorts of modalities where you're not necessarily taking a full image and, you know, maybe AI can, can help, you know, fill in the gaps it's missing. So then you could have really point of care uses of magnetic resonance, but it's all speculation. <laughs> I understand why you're speculating. If we'd asked ourselves, where would you be in five years, five years ago, yeah. looking at today, <laughs> none of us would have guessed that. But I agree, Larry, it's a hugely evolving world, um, MRI. One of the things I would like to see is that we're able to deliver sort of better pre precision-based medicine, but do that globally. So, you know, whether you're the poorest or the richest country in the world, we're able to actually impact on healthcare um, through the way we deliver the technology, whether that's, you know, through industry developments and helping simplify things so there's a better base standard of care and that can be delivered throughout, you know, the globe um, with, you know, cheaper hardware or, you know, more sustainable options as far as hardware. But also, um, yeah, for me, I think that, we, we keep trying to make things quicker and easier, but it doesn't mean that. It just means we have to do more in the time. But I think I, I'm really passionate about improving healthcare. I think um, we have so much scientific advance and it's, it's, that's one of the most exciting things about our meeting. You can see what's going to be happening in the future because what, what you're getting presented today is something that's going to take five years to come to us on, on the coal face, so to speak. Um, so yeah, if you want to know what's happening in 10 years time, Come to the conference today because you'll see see what's uh, evolving as we speak. Larry, aren't you working on those cores at the moment? <laughs> yeah, it is true. It's very hard to predict, and um, you know, uh, sometimes the you know the next you know sort of wave of the future is buried back in the poster section, and is you know not the buzz of the meeting, and it turns out that you know five years later to be the you know, the next direction. I remember the parallel imaging sort of started that way. It was, uh, you know, the Dan Sedixon's introduction of Smash was not, not an oral presentation. It was, uh, it was back in the poster hall. Yeah, the back. And, uh, you know, it was, it was hard to, to see that, that how that was going to play out. That seems to be a common theme, though, because Denny LeBahan was talking last year about how his first uh, presentation on diffusion imaging <laughs> was in the back hall <laughs> and there was one other poster on the uh, diffusion <laughs> and he happened to start speaking to um, somebody that gave him the introduced him to the tensor <laughs> so maybe there is a place for you know the future being at the back of the poster hall anyway sorry Chris it's over there a little well, bit what we're saying there is that we everyone who registers should actually check out the posters as well yes good it's, point <laughs> It's so true. There's so much, so much gold in there that you know you might not believe it, but it will it will come through and it'll be it'll be product before you know it. So, and that's one of the amazing things um, with the ICMR and the SMRT that the, the the content is is just amazing. There's the the cutting edge clinical content that's out there now. There's there's stuff that's coming through. It's just so um, uh, multidisciplinary. There's so many different people involved, and I think that's. That's absolutely fantastic, but um, uh, we'll yeah. see what comes. <laughs> if I could just put in a plug for browsing the posters, I think that's one of the things that we uh, we paid attention to early um, to try to make the digital posters easy to browse and uh, go to the browse D posters and they come up as these little uh, mini posters. We call them teaser slides, three across on your screen and you can okay. just scroll down. Each poster has, you know, the title, authors, mini synopsis, two figures and two figure captions and a little institutional logo. And so you can just browse through literally hundreds of them. And then, of course, click, click on the ones that catch your eye. Yeah, it's very easy to navigate, isn't it? I must say the whole program is, is simply amazing. You've, you've done such a great job to deliver it in such a format that people who don't normally attend the international meeting, we've got to remember that it is the international meeting. You mm -hmm. should register straight away and get on. But um, Larry and Sean, I'm going to ask you the difficult questions now. I think it's time for a quick fire round okay. <laughs> of questions. 
Right, so <laughs> who's your hero and why? Who's my hero? Well, my... Go for Larry. Who's your hero? <laughs> I think you're tired. <laughs> Well, I, I, my mind just immediately jumped to sort of scientific heroes, so okay. I'll answer that direction. And it's got to be somebody like Enrico Fermi, mm -hmm. who just had this amazing physical intuition. Yeah. yeah. I am going to have to say my ultimate dinner guest would be Nelson Mandela, so I'm going to stick with Nelson Mandela, and I don't think it needs to be. a good political. <laughs> Excellent. More political one, yeah. <laughs> okay. Shauna and Larry, what book are you currently reading? The Coming. <laughs> the Ice <laughs> and the Reading Program book. <laughs> no, you know, it's, fu it's funny. I'm actually reading a book by an ISMRM member, uh, past <laughs> president uh, Vivian uh, Lee, oh. has a book on the U.S. healthcare system mm -hmm. and, you know, essentially what's wrong with it, which should be a book about, you know, this thick. <laughs> Yeah. But it's, it's a very nice book uh, chronicling, uh, you know, some of the issues with the way the U.S. healthcare system is set up. Fantastic. It's literally on my nightstand right now. <laughs> I've written it down to read next. I'm re reading it as uh, Michelle Obama's Becoming at the moment. So back to the political ones, I guess. <laughs> yeah. We've got a lot of time at the another moment. Another question, another question. <laughs> okay. What's your favorite? Do you have a favorite sport? And if you do, what is it? Yeah, I would have to say soccer. Yeah. I enjoy playing it and watching it. Nice. P football tea. Putty. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> there, I guess. We call it soccer over here as well. Soccer Football's too. Many people yeah. around the world. I used to be a sports citizen, but I absolutely love all sports. Um, but I used to be a pro volleyballer, so I'm going to say volleyball. But I do know that Chris was a bit of a soccer star, so you'd have yeah, to well, <laughs> work with Larry. <laughs> an open star, but yes, I definitely like like soccer and did play a bit before um, before getting involved in in um, MRI. But yeah, yeah, good sport. Um, favorite food? What's your favorite food? Ooh, that's a tough one. It is, isn't it? There's lots of variety. That's I not that. <laughs> I'm going to say Jamaican. Jamaican, <laughs> <Megan>, nice. <clears throat> I would say um, the burrito. Yes. Ooh, classic. <laughs> sort of a little bit narrower category, but. Uh, yeah. Excellent. All right, and the last question to each of you individually What piece of advice would you offer yourself or would you have given yourself 20 years ago? Uh, mm. That's actually an easy one for me. I'm always like uh, regretting that I didn't learn to write well. You know, so much of, you know, nobody ever tells, you know, scientists and engineers that actually your career depends on you being able to write well and write quickly. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, that extends broader, but, you know, generally, you know, presenting, it's not, it's not enough to, do good work and have great ideas, you have to like communicate them. So I, I would expand that to, you know, communication, working on the, the actual nuts and bolts of that communication. That is great advice. I'm going to take your advice from 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go back uh, in time. <laughs> I think for me, I would say um, follow what you're passionate about. Don't doubt it. Just keep going. What you're mm -hmm. passionate, whether it's science, sports, whatever, clinical question. Your passion is like you're on the money. So yeah. Excellent. Well, Larry and Shauna, thank you so much for taking the time to to talk to all our members. Um, we know you've had so much happening this year. It's, it, it's completely unprecedented, and we thank you both for the amount of effort you've put in, um, both for the ICMRM and the SMR team for our our joint communities. I think it's been phenomenal. And, and all I can say, Trevor, is get on and register. I think it is an amazing meeting. You'll be missing out if you don't do it. And there's a lot of social stuff happening during the meeting, but get on now, register and, and be a part of our amazing communities.